My guest this week on Behes with Barkha is T.M. Krishna, the author of a fascinating new book called Sebastian and Sons. He's of course a acclaimed musician himself, but this book looks at caste discrimination in particular um, among the community of Nidangam makers, many of whom are Dalit. This is an important book. This is a book that taught me a lot. This is a book that actually made me sit up and take notice. And it made me realize that every time I have been at a concert, I have actually not even noticed what the Mridangam is made from. Yeah. And you describe it in graphic detail yeah. in the beginning of the book. Before we get to that, why did you want to write this book? Well, exactly for the reasons uh, you just stated. Uh, it was a wake-up call for me in the sense that, you know, I talked about culture, caste, art for many years now, written and all that. I suddenly realized one day that I had not thought of the makers or the makers of any instrument mm -hmm. that in my horizon, they didn't exist. Right. So and I'm having this, you know, progressive arrogance of upper caste male progressive arrogance, if I may add, mm -hmm. uh, of being engaging with, you know, discrimination and it becomes a kind of a chip on your shoulder. Yeah. Right. It's the truth. And then because but you need to always be very careful with it. And then one day I was looking at my older book, uh, Southern Music, Carnatic Story. And we're trying to review it for another edition. And I'm looking at the cast chapter. Uh, and I see that there is not a mention of a, of a maker. There's no mention of those who make the instruments. And this is blatant discrimination. And I'm like, I didn't even realize it. So this book came from that real slap on my face mm. that I got from my own discourse. And I said, no, I have to start talking to them. I didn't know it was a book when I started it. Yeah. I said, so I started... My first interview was with the oldest maker alive then. He's not with us anymore, Selvaraj. Yeah. And the book starts with him. Yeah. And, you know, you say this is a new world to you. I can tell you this was an entirely new world to me. I'm Even Karn though you inhabit that Exactly. I'm a Carnatic musician. I started learning Carnatic music when I was six years old. I've been performing from when I'm 12, when I was 12. And this was a completely new world world of people, world of thinking, world of relationships and, you know, um, making and and that's that instrument is there with me every day when I'm on stage. And had you never paused to think, one, were you aware that it was stitched together, not just from jackfruit, but also from animal hides? Two, did you ever think about the people who made that? Look, we all know, we all know that it's made of cow, buffalo and goat skin. You know what? I didn't know that. Okay. I read the book. Okay. Those who play it are yeah. in the world of in the field know it. Yeah. Probably people outside who audiences, mm -hmm. even if they're engaged with Carnatic music, many audiences don't know, by the way. Yeah. But even if I knew that, it was not something that I ever processed seriously in my head. You know, mm -hmm. that says a lot, right? Yeah, it's made of skin. Okay, fine. You know, let's go on. So, and then about the people, what does it mean? Now, for example, okay, it's made of hide. But what does it mean when you make something out of skin? Yeah. The whole process of how do you get that skin? Yeah. The whole process of what are you doing with it? Who is doing it? Where are they doing it? All this is done behind a giant screen. And my mind, I talk for myself, had never even thought about those things. You know, until I said, let, I, let me enter this world. So, you know, so it's very important I say this because we know a lot of things. Doesn't mean we engage with those things, right? In fact, most things we don't want to engage with, we know it as information. And we probably parrot it to somebody else. Mm. You know, like I've given leg dims in so many schools mm. for children. And the first thing when you do, you know, we go speak Mekhe or anything. You say, you know, so this is a violin. This is a mridangam. What's a mridangam made of? And I've said this, made of jackfruit wood, cow skin, goat skin, buffalo skin. And I've not thought for a moment the complexity of what I've uttered. Mm. Not for a moment. Now, in this age that we live in, when you write a book about Dalits, uh, some are Dalit Christians have converted, uh, who are making these, or crafting, I want to use the word crafting, yeah, crafting the, the, these mridangams from these different animal hides, including cow, goat and buffalo uh, hides. This is something that can get easily politicized because we are unable to have this conversation calmly anymore. Yeah. We live in an age where Muslim cattle traders or that Dalit cattle traders are lynched by moms. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. for working in this trade. Was part of your motive to lift this veil of hypocrisy off from this conversation? Well, the timing was accidental. 
Yeah, but because it true. looks almost, yeah, the timing was entirely, you know, a book for the political age. And the timing was accidental. I mean, I've been working on this for four years. I didn't know when I was going to write. Finally, I said, you know, I just need to write it. But yes, it was to pull off the whale too. There's no doubt that that was in my mind because the whale was pulled off for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so it was important to come face to face to see, I mean, the dichotomies and the fluidities mm. of this, you know, I'm not even going to posit them against each other. Mm. The fact that you worship the cow on one side and the fact that you need the cow skin to make that divine music. I mean, just listen to what I said now. And it's, it's, it's fascinating how we inhabit these spaces. And this book hopes to also say that it's important that we navigate, we navigate that. that. You know, not say that, you know, this is ugly, this is horrible, throw it away. No, but you navigate that. Because I think if we can start navigating that, then in the present political context, we'll be able to navigate so many of the violent thoughts that are being thrown at us every day. If we can have this conversation that explores that distance between, let's say, the audience and the instrument on the stage, the player and the craftsman who's given him or her that 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 instrument. I think the point you're making is you could probably have the more difficult political conversations so. of our time. This book does not spare us the gore, the blood and gore yeah. of, of how that skinning takes place. Yeah. And actually you describe it to be quite a precise science. Yes, it's it not is. that any part of the skin is picked up. Oh, exactly. Them with them. Absolutely. Can you speak a little bit about that and why you felt the need to be so specific, so graphic? Well, I start with the graphic. You know, I was I had never gone to an abattoir in my life. Okay. Do you um, eat meat? I do eat meat now. I mean, when I wrote the book, I say I was I'm a fish eater, mm, yeah. but now I eat meat. Um, but I had never been to an abattoir. You know, I've seen these videos and you've heard stories. Yeah. I expected myself to puke or collapse or anything. That's honestly how I entered the space. Yeah. But none of that happened to me. I go in there and it was like I entered an entirely new reality. And that reality was normal. For the makers, yeah, for, for the those. This is their the livelihood and this is their work. It was normal. And so, you know, it raises so many questions, you know, about uh, love, about care, about, you know, killing, about violence. It, it confuses so many things in my head. It confused me. So I go there and I almost became part of a completely different novel, which is every day, there's blood, go, there's gooey stuff everywhere. People are drinking tea, cracking a joke. And this is every day. And by 12 o'clock, that place is cleaned up and life goes on. It was, for me, sh shocking on how I entered a different world. And it came out more nuanced in my head about these things. Mm. You know, animal ab activists may have a problem with that whole chapter, highly probable that they'll yeah. say, you know. But I'm saying, we have to, you know, animal activism and environmental activism, where is social justice in it? Yeah. We have to discuss it in parallel. We have to look at the nuances of, of the people who are also engaged in it. People, whether what does that livelihood mean? When a villager or an agriculturist rears a goat, loves the goat, kisses the goat every day, and there's a relationship, and then sends the same goat out. Are you saying that, what is that, again, what is that journey of relationship? I think all this was a learning there. I felt it was very important that the reader engage with it for two reasons. One, to realize that there is so much nuance to this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it's not an evil or good. It's not a good versus evil battle. It's great. The other thing is also this whole notion of purity and impurity. You know, um, most things that we upper caste people are do is considered pure. Okay, in some notion, there's a moralistic valuation to it. I don't mm. know how the hell we do it. So these instruments or this music, you know, even a maker says, you know, the music begins and it's all heaven. Maker says it in the book. Okay. Yeah. And that's true. You come to a concert, you come to me and tell me that you experienced God, you experienced something other world. You go to the Maradangam play and say, my God, mm. now where did that begin? How did you find the, not just the audience, that is the last piece of the puzzle, but the the performers, the musicians navigate this paradox because there is discrimination, but it's almost normalized discrimination because I know there's a very moving moment where you describe what Selvaraj eats and you say that he eats the leftovers that yeah. Mani Iyer yeah, leaves for him and it's considered normal. And in another part of the book, uh, you know, one of these Vridangam makers is talking about how if one of their relatives comes back with money from the big city, it, it could be the same amount of money. It could be 1000 yeah. rupees and it's normal. But if an Iyer gives that money, 
it suddenly you know, has that this statement value. hit me. Yeah. It was so hard because uh, it was actually wife of a maker and she yeah. said it yeah. so fast. And I said, what did you say? And I said, this is what she said. So two things. One is, I, you know, I also want to address the other thing you asked me, right? About um, just before I, it mm. just slips my mind, but anyway, I'll come back. Mm. You know, the whole notion of, for example, how do players navigate it? How yeah. do I think... Like if you confront them with the question that this Mridangam that you're playing is made by Dalits who have put it together using animal hide, which includes the skin of a cow. Unfortunately, first, uh, most people don't discuss it. It's not talked about. I mean, even in older interviews, you will find may players saying they use only dead skin, which mm -hmm. is a lie. Or they will say that, you know... Is you it a lie? It is a lie. You cannot use, by the way, naturally dead skin. By the way, let me correct myself. That is if an animal is dead. Can you skin it and use it? The maker will tell you not possible. Maker will clearly tell you, you need to actually kill the animal and use that skin because it's got to do with what happens to skin after an animal dies. So are you saying the mridangams cannot be made without a certain degree of the slaughter of go goats, buffaloes and cows? Yes. Bluntly put, yes. So not just that you're taking the skin of already dead cows you, and may you, have you, died naturally. You, you cannot from use, old age. You cannot use... Listen, they use the skin of... All three are females, okay? Mm -hmm. They use the skin and they also want to find out if the cow is delivered at least twice. Because if it's delivered twice, the skin has more elasticity. Mm -hmm. Then, they, it has to be, so it has to be healthy. It can't be old. It can't be too young. So these are all specific. They also look at the nature of the skin. They don't like cows that are what we call in the South, Delhi cows, by the way. It has to be native cows. And the best cows are in Tanjaur. And then there is which part of the skin is used for which part of the instrument. So when there is so much detailing. But I will tell you what the Mridangam players have even now saying. are saying. Yes. Even now are saying. What are they you saying? Know, after this they'll say, one is they'll say, no, but we don't kill it for this. It's anyway being killed for meat. We happen to use the skin. It's like people using leather saying that, you know, I got nothing to do with animal violence because anyway it's going to be killed. This is one excuse that's all, always given. And the maker in, in an old interview, and I quote the maker, says, what do these people know about skin? We, cho we choose the cow. We look for healthy skin. So it, you can't just look at a cow on the street, slaughter it and use that skin. The maker is looking. When I went to the slaughterhouse and I describe it, we went and we chose buffalo skin. And I have a maker with me and I have a, a person who works in the slaughterhouse. And the maker looks at it and says, touch that. Okay. It's just skin buffalo. Okay. I wouldn't be able to do it. So I touch it. I don't know what I'm looking for. Yeah. Okay, it's just some gooey thing I'm touching. And he says, okay, touch the other one. So I go and touch it. He says, oh, we are picking that. No, to me, both were the same. So I'm saying there is, we, they refuse to accept for that, that, for the sound that they demand and they want and for that exquisiteness they want in their playing. There is so much detailing. I mean, for, for one side of the Mridana, they use especially skin from the flank of the goat. It's not just any part. There is the back of the cow is you back of the buffalo is used for something else. The sides. So all this is science. All this is a specific science. But if you refuse to engage robustly with this, because you're scared by I think the fear is that if we accept all this, then are we revealing the fact that there is something impure in what we are What doing? happens after this book? Do you believe that there will be a different debate? on what the Mridangam should be assembled from? Well, I know that was not the purpose of this conversation, no. but that may well be the consequence of it. Well. But I think professionals know. I mean, there's already experiments with synthetic materials. There have been people who, I mean, before the book was written. So that's always already happening. But every professional will tell you how important, how the sound of the, from the skin is entirely different than what you can get synthetically. Maybe in the future it's possible it will move to that direction. But I hope also the conversations are about the relationships. And like you you indicated about this whole Selvaraj, you know, speaking, the complexity of that relationship, the complexity of how... But there's also an internalized yeah. servitude. But isn't that what any kind of discriminative system does? So my question was going to be, how does class intersect with caste here? So, I always believe class is... The veneer. It's the cover. If behind any class discrimination, there is a fundamental social discriminative form. It could be gender, it could be caste, ethnicity, color, race or anything. And class plays a role, which is why Dalits tell you even now that if they earn money and they work in an IT profession, they still hide their names. 
Now, if class was all of it, that the class should have disappeared. So, you know, I also feel we use class as a trope. Hmm. Do you, did you find in the writing or the researching of this book a generational shift? Did you find younger Dalits less willing to accept or internalize? Yeah, I mean, it comes out in the book yes. where I think, I think even the move from Tanjore to Chennai made a shift. Because first workplace, they started getting their stores. You know, at least the, the makers in Chennai already had shops. The people from Tanjore were still going to the homes. Now, I think homes, I think another thing comes out. You know, what's the difference between a home in a village vis-a-vis -vis in a city where the space is smaller? Then lines are redrawn yeah. uh, where you can enter. Where is the work happening? Work is happening near the dining table necessarily. Yeah. A lot of things start moving. Then I feel the younger generation definitely are far more robust. I think that's also got to do with the social transformation of Tamil Nadu. I think Periyar is an important character in that. The conversation of caste being something that is even now very active. Tamil Nadu is not the greatest place for Dalits. Uh, we have one of the highest honor killings in the country. Nevertheless, I think caste discourse and discrimination being such an important part of our politics has also changed the next generation makers. Like even when they spoke to me, they would never shy away from the question of caste. Mm -hmm. uh, I could directly ask the question and they would challenge me in my notions, sometimes disagree with me. How did the book change you as a, as a performer? As a performer, do you now... Because, you know, you speak about being this musician, acclaimed musician, famous name, who's been performing since he was a child. And so many of us are unthinking in our uh, privilege. Yeah. Yeah. And you write a little bit about that, about your yeah, own I privilege. I keep reading that in the book too, because yeah. I think it's very important. I think it changed me in many ways. Uh, fundamentally, it also changed the little things I do at home. Like? I mean, I'll give you an example. There's a person who's worked at, worked at our home for the last 40 years. He's known me from when I'm a five-year-old kid. And I talk about, you know, Indian languages have this uh, have the flexibility of respect for an, for an elder person, right? And uh, I always called him <coughs> with a non-respective knee. I never noticed it. He's much older than me. He's in his 60s. It's when I was doing this book that I realized that mm. I do that to him. I never respected him in the way I should. So now I'm, I'm making an effort every time I talk to him, every time uh, the tone of how I talk to him. You know, it's in the tone. So many times it's not what you say, it's how you say it. I mean, my tone to him has entirely been disrespectful. Mm. That's the truth. And like you said, um, in his case, he's also accepted that fact that it comes from my caste and my feudalism and caste and feudalism and all this go together. And it's, it's never... And, it's never been um, addressed, obviously, by me. And he would have, for him, it was a normal. And this book has made me question every one of those little actions that we do. Uh, you know, the, I think we do this so unthinkingly yeah. many times. And for my music, tremendous change. My notions of sound, my notions of, of beauty, of idea of, you know, when I see Murdangam being played, I'm not only looking at the fingers of the player, I'm looking at actually the stitches now. When the, when, when the player, I had a concert in Trivandrum two days ago and uh, my Murudangam artist was tuning it. And as the Murudangam artist tuning it, I'm looking at the membrane move. I've never noticed that. You know? So, and I'm, I'm thinking, of, I think it changes the way you feel about sound. It changes the way I sing. My, my voice sounds different. Hopefully better. I don't know. <laughs> but you, uh, before this book was launched officially, there was controversy around it. And the event was cancelled in, in Chennai before it was moved to the Asian College of Journalism. What is the reason that um, people are scared of this book? Brahmin equal patriarchy, simply put. Um, because there was an excerpt that appeared in the newspaper. Yes, of Mani Iyer. Yes, mm. I, I actually thought that was such a fascinating So talk a little bit about who Mani Iyer is. So people who wrote Palgat Mani Iyer is the doyen of Murdangam playing, the most uh, revered percussionist in this country pretty much. Uh, his influence goes across the country. He's considered the person who gave the Murdangam its status. And of course, he's a fabulous artist and an exquisite artist. Um, but he also um, was a Brahmin. And there's no doubt that he was probably first Brahmin who actually dominated the field of Mradangam playing. You must understand that Brahmins did not traditionally play the Mradangam because of exactly this reason. 
that the, it had skin. Yeah, okay. And then they, um, there is cross influence from the Mara- Marathas coming to the south of India. And then slowly Brahmins start playing. And there's a social cultural history to it. I'll leave that aside. And But he's the first person who challenged another community, a community called the Isabelaras, who were close to the Devadasis, the same artistry community. Right. And they were the ones dominating this field. And Manir comes and just takes over. By then, Carnatic music is becoming also more a Brahminical, Brahmin system, yeah. Brahmin practice yeah. system. Yeah. So this man is this dynamic great artist who is also so dependent on the Dalit Mridagam maker because he wants this sound. He's he's an obsessed man. Okay? And he wants the maker to travel with him when yeah, he travels and all travel of that. I mean, he was one of those guys who was obsessed and for his Mridagam and his playing, he'll do anything. Mm. I mean, pretty much anything. So that excerpt is a fascinating excerpt, okay? Because here is this man who worships the cow and he suddenly realizes the dichotomy. And he says, I worship it, but I need great skin. So he wonders what to do. And there's an incident, and I, I'm not sure if the incident is connected to his conundrum, but anyway, the incident is there's this Mridangam maker called Al Katan, and Manir goes to him and says, Get me great cow skin. So this man says, I need 100 rupees. He says, here's 100 rupees, get it to me. So after a few hours, Manir comes back home and he sees a cow in front of his house. So al says, but the seller wants 120 rupees. Are you okay with it? Now, this is the first time. This is an ethical situation. Manir is faced with actually the animal that's going to be killed for him to get that skin. To me, this... And then he goes to ask Rajaji, see Rajagopalachari, and says, um, around that time, okay, anyway, and he says... Uh, what do I do? And Sri Raju Gopalachari gives him a super excuse in my books and says, never uh, look for the source of a river or the antecedents of a rishi. Mm. And to me, that's a, such a convenient upper caste cop out, mm. you know, because you don't want to know what's happening behind and you don't care about the people who do it. Right? So this ex- except appeared. For me, Manir comes out as a thinking human being there. Who's conflicted? Isn't that beautiful? But somehow this rang alarm bells everywhere that you were talking about cow skin. And I think the political context of today definitely played a huge role. And the whole notion that this divine art form needed the death of a cow for it to be divine. Are people still reacting with disbelief or denial? Yes, a lot of lot of people within the inner circles, yes. But I think a lot of other people are also saying we never knew this. Yeah, yeah. I- it's a deeply political book. It may not have set out to be political. I mean political in the deepest sense, no, not it party is. politics. No, no, it's no, a no, political book. Yeah. You are a deeply political person. Uh, we are in an age where people pay a price for their politics. I know I read of the odd concert, the TM Krishna concert that gets cancelled. How often is that happening to you for taking a position on issues like the citizenship legislation, the NRC, you went to Shaheen Bagh. We are talking to you in a capital which is, which has seen the worst, most horrific yeah, riots absolutely. that that I have seen as an adult in the city. Uh, what is the price you've had to pay for being political? Well, the price is threats. Price is cancellations. Price is, uh, um, you know, needing security at times. Um, has that happened? Yes, often. it has happened. It has happened off and on. So death threats. Uh, yeah, sometimes not to me, but the organizer would mm-hmm. be told that yeah. you know. Yeah. Don't have it. You're but that's have it. actually a more insidious way of it intimidating. Is. It right? is. It because is. individually, we probably would stand and stand up. Yeah. So they then they go to the organizer and say something. And uh, so these things happen. But honestly, Bharka, I I feel that we are so much in the public eye and so much. So in, we, have, we are still privileged. We are still protected. privileged enough. And I would be worried about all those individuals in, in Delhi, in Northeast Delhi yeah. today. You went to the riot? Yes, areas. I went this morning. And, and what, did you, what are the impressions you come back with? I mean, the, the horrors that it has done to everyday lives and people's homes and people's relationships and love and, and, and care and economy and social structure and social belief systems is traumatic schools. I mean, people are, you know, this morning there were many roads of this sweeping and trying to get some normalcy back. Uh, but, but, you know, everybody tells you that street is full usually. And now there are just few shops opening. And, it, you know, a couple of ironic things I saw and I just couldn't get off. There's one thing I couldn't get off my mind is I went to the school that was attacked at about 4 p.m. is said and it was closed at 1.30 and the children had gone. Went to the first floor and it's all burnt and on the blackboard there is a, there is Ravana and there is Rama shooting Ravana 
and it says good over evil. I mean, Barka, I have mm, not, I have yeah. not got over that, and that's mm. obviously drawn the day this had happened because school has not been opened from then. Mm. And I'm saying, and then there's another sweet shop being opened in a back street with mm. this charred homes everywhere. And there are homes that are locked and gone. Yeah. And you know, you hear, hear multiple voices. Some people are saying everybody did this. And then there was this guy who went across in a scooter who saw us entering a relief camp, which was in a Muslim locality, saying, "Why are you going there? You must go to the Hindu locality." And he drove past us at the same time. And then you have some in a parking lot, five people talking about NRC and C and saying they are using it as an excuse. To kill us, it is so volatile. Yeah. And the, but we can't run away from two things. There's nothing accidental about what happened. I think we have to say it again and again and or again. Spontaneous. Nothing. Or spontaneous. Nothing. No, or spontaneous. Yeah. No. This is a planned thing. You create, you target a community. In this case, you target the Muslim community, and then create a spiral of violence. And once you create a spiral of violence, then everybody is killing everybody. Everybody is targeting everybody. But because Hindus have suffered as well. Well, of, of course. course, that's why I'm saying. And the worst part is when we're using the word "but" after talking about somebody's death. Yeah. I can't get over that, and we are doing this every day. Yes, somebody was killed, but I mean, how can there be a but? And now we're going to count. You know, we're going to count bodies and say so many Hindu bodies and so many Muslim bodies. I mean, yeah. it's terrorizing. It is truly terrorizing. It's terrorizing to the nature of people that we are making ourselves to be. Did you get the impression? Because that is my another thing that sits with me after six days of going to these areas every day is is a sense of a community having been orphaned. I saw neither central politicians nor uh, Delhi politicians. I saw no politicians. It's something I'm unable to explain um, because I'm sure they all tell you that nobody has come. Nobody has come. Whatever effort is going is because of voluntary groups doing what they can and scrambling. Yeah. And this is the capital city. Yeah. It is not some rural place that we normally ignore. Not that it's right. I'm just saying it out yeah. there. And the fact is, no politician has come there. Yeah. Nobody has even said anything that matters. Nobody has said anything. You know, it really doesn't matter what these people do in Parliament. I really want to say it. I know Parliament opened today and there's yeah. shouting and screaming. Yeah. You have not gone to the place where people are crying today yeah. that their friends have died and people have been thrown into yeah. the canal. Yeah. You have no business making a show of in parliament. I'm sorry, I'm telling everybody this I because agree. then it becomes about you making it a show in parliament. The fact is, you don't care. If you cared, you will first go there. You will set up camps. You will make sure there are people. You will make sure you're holding hands. Yeah. You're doing nothing, and. You know, and most of these people are, are watching. I think a lot of Hindi news. And three gen, three gentlemen came to me and said, "The press have done us no favor. They have not shown what has really happened here." We I have, get we I, a lot of that. You know, I get. I, show us I, big media. Yeah, watch. and they said that at one thirty-two in the night. I'm waiting to see the my truth. story. Yeah, it's like I met these two sisters whose hus whose brothers were pulled out from a drain. Two brothers. And they said you're not going to show our story. And I said I will show your story. I'll send you the story after I do it. And I did. But there is that sense of being orphaned by media, you know, everybody, by you know, by everybody. And, and you know what? What's even very disturbing is when people direct you to sites where there have been horrible things. People see you walking, and you they know you're an outsider, right? And, and they stop you and say, "Aap kahan ja rahe? Ya wahan jaiye? Wahan to baat kharab hai." The, the, that mm. people are so desperate in mm. such a situation. That they want you to go and see that. Yeah. I mean, it should. We should be. But you know, weeping a, <laughs> that this is. Oh, where we should we be are. weeping, but there is a larger problem here, which is even bigger than this riot, and that is that there is a complete breakdown of our ability to talk to each other as people across ideologies. Uh, the fact that in the backdrop of the citizenship legislation, you know, names, slogans like "Desh ke gadaro ko, goli mare salo ko" were actually raised yeah. two days ago in the heart of the capital. Yeah. I want you to reflect a little bit uh, on what the failure has been. Why are liberals not able to communicate? Why are we not able to make ourselves heard? Why are people not willing to accept many of the arguments? When I say people, I mean that there is a kind of 
populism or a nativism rather that is stoked and it's it's not happening just in india it's happening globally yeah i think that's one of the struggles of today that it's not just happening in india and makes it much harder to have that conversation right islamophobia is an yeah. international immig anti immigration exactly. tendencies the two parts to it one is the fact that what is happening today is something that the rss and company have been working on for the last 60 70 years in terms of a cultural program mm -hmm. that you need to culturally transform this mm -hmm. land in, into believing in believing a certain sense of hindutva which is itself a monolithic <coughs> marginalizing idea mm -hmm. parallelly this is also we are going to we have to react and respond to whatever happens immediately and that's something you just have to do but it is a moment that the progressive world needs to think mm -hmm. and i feel one of the biggest problems in the progressive discourse is an inability to engage with culture faith and ritual mm -hmm. absolutely okay and i and i i i know it's messy i will lay it out straight yes there's discrimination there's gender issues there's caste issues i know it's messy which is why we should have been engaging with it even more the fact is we've allowed bigots to create a scenario where we say modern democratic india is the antithesis of civilizational india that's the discourse we are hearing today that 70 years of democracy is not what india is india is in some vague antiquity purity notion and the, the reason for that is a condescension from the progressive world towards many of the within quotes traditional practices which includes faith how can we not respect faith faith is hope for many people they get up in the morning and when they pray in front of their god it's the hope that that day will be better or something nice will happen we have refused you know we can use big jargons that we you know we understand it aesthetically we understand it in terms of human need no you have to understand it in terms of religious need we have to it doesn't matter whether you believe or not it's irrelevant whether i'm a believer or you're a believer is irrelevant but which is why i think artists and people of culture are so important today we need because to because you have that language that we don't I, exactly and we have to find find a way through music through dance through children to speaking you know we have to we have to try things we honestly barka if you ask me how we're going to do it i had no other answer for it is there also an elitism is there also an elitism there's deracination of not having the language of faith uh, and culture and tradition there's also elitism there's a, there's something smug and supercilious about feeling like my politics is better than yours and therefore i'm not going to talk to you if you voted the other side i'm not going to talk to you if you believe in something that i don't believe in i'm not going to no, talk to you ex you know that's a very important point because there are a huge number of people who are called in the middle yeah i think most of india is that now we are not talking to those people because what antagonizes them is the tone of us saying talking you know, down to a person who's a you know if you're a if you have shades of a certain kind of conservatism then i don't think i can talk to you because you don't understand equality and democracy mm -hmm. that's rubbish how i mean how many progressive are, progressive people are caste this how many progressive people i mean are absolutely discriminatory in terms of gender you know so i'm just saying this again we have also in the progressive world position conservatism and progressiveness as opposites no they coexist within us within every one of us which is why i'm saying that you know so many rituals that happen at homes you know so and even faith in, at my home i mean i go to a temple why do i go because i just want to go i don't go to a temple too i mean the fact that you also the progress so almost is cultural so you know progress is something they want demand um it's like when you see a progressive person going to a temple sometimes they feel almost apologetic apologetic tell you why they went why should i feel apologetic apologetic about it why why you know respect is the word that is lacking in the progressive discourse respect to faith yeah and i mean sincere respect not a political move people know it when it is a strategy people know it when it's true and the fact is we've allowed that to pass and now you have bigots manipulating that space and owning it owning it and then creating such ugliness out of it i don't know sometimes with the human beings i mean i was just telling somebody you know rama allah jesus and there is this violence is it i mean who is becoming ugly is rama allah and jesus becoming ugly or human being is becoming ugly what is the beauty what is i don't know anymore
Yeah, well, many questions and you raised some very thoughtful questions in this book. Thank you so much. Thank Sebastian you. and Sons by T.M. Krishna, do read it. It will make you think. Even if you don't agree with it, even if you want to resist it, read it. Open our minds to thoughts is something that we've stopped doing. Yeah. And I hope this book helps us do that. Thank you. Thank you, Prakash.